Discovering Alabama is a production of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. Earlier in the morning, before this fire burned through, you could sit quietly out here and see all sorts of critters. Now, while the smoke still lingers, there's little visible sign of the animals that make their home here. Hi, I'm Doug Phillips. I'm here in the southern longleaf pine forest that was just subjected to an intentional fire, or what's called a prescribed burn. Prescribed burning is a management technique used to actually benefit the forest. For many reasons, fire is particularly helpful in the longleaf forest. The longleaf pine itself is pretty resilient to fire. But what about the animals? The woodpeckers, the quail, the deer, the turkey, the snakes and the tortoises. Where did they go? Join me for an excursion into the secret places of the longleaf forest to see what we can uncover about the animals that make their home here. This program is about a land unknown to many people, a land that in many ways has escaped the hustle and bustle of modern civilization place with bountiful backcountry, forests, streams, and wildlife more diverse than can be found in much of the inhabited world. Come along with me as we explore the natural wonders of this land. Come along as we discover Alabama. Welcome to Discovering Alabama, and to what appears to be a rather sterile environment. After all, it's just been cleansed by fire. But despite the recent burn, this is an enchanted forest with a great many mysteries waiting to be discovered. Now, the tall longleaf pines invite our gaze upward to their emerald beauty. But to understand the wonder of the longleaf forest, we need to look not up, but down. Well, the diversity in this forest is in the ground cover. The species that really support the, all the wildlife that are here are close to the ground. We have the ferns that you can see coming out now, grasses, uh, their sunflowers, their beans, uh, their blackberry sprouts. So the diversity is really on the ground here. Nobody looked at the ground until about 20 years ago. And then they, we started setting up plots and we found out how much is right there on the ground. Uh, biodiversity can be measured on a lot of different levels. Uh, if you measure it on a on the small unit area level and look at the entire uh, biota, uh, ground cover, the, the uh, invertebrates, and all of the uh, living things that exist there. Uh, native longleaf ecosystems, those that have been maintained by fire, uh, are among the most diverse in the world. If you look at the larger landscape, uh, over tens of thousands of acres, uh, it still remains one of the most diverse landscapes. From Virginia through Alabama and into Texas, the Longleaf Forest commanded an estimated 92 million acres. Many scientists believe the Longleaf ecosystem was the largest to ever exist on Earth under one canopy of trees. Today, the mighty Longleaf has been reduced to an estimated 2.9 million acres, a tiny fraction of its historic domain. Yet, among what is left of the Longleaf Kingdom, there remains a diversity of life that brings a different dimension to the Alabama landscape.
Forest management tools like fire have helped slow the rapid decline in the South's and Alabama's longleaf forest. But scientists, industry leaders, private landowners, and government realize there's a great deal more that must be done if generations to come are to know the magic of this enchanted forest. But as is the case with so many other environmental issues, finding the best strategy for the future can be more complex than it might first appear. We were aware that the acreage in Florida had declined more precipitously than other areas. And at some point, uh, some environmentalists became, got in the right places in the state to propose a bill uh, that would uh, halt all harvesting of longleaf pine across the state. Well, that's something that's impossible to keep quiet and got out to a lot of private landowners and foresters. And uh, a lot of people were looking at having a large percentage of what they owned was tied up in the timber on this land, uh, restricted, and they went out and, and uh, cut a lot of that longleaf down in fairly short order. Uh, so what we take as the, uh, see as the message that come from this is uh, probably the worst thing that can happen to longleaf pine is to see it put on a threatened and endangered species list. We need insurance. Rather than seeking to restore the longleaf forest for the sake of ecology alone, Groups like the Longleaf Alliance are taking a pragmatic approach, promoting the ecological and economic values of longleaf pine ecosystems. Uh, the long, longleaf is, is uh, a species I th very well suited to uh, the best of, of uh, making money from the tree itself and also maintaining uh, desirable ecosystem, ecosystems, or at least ecosystems we think are desirable. So uh, uh, it's, it's really the best of both worlds. The folks hoping to reverse the decline of the longleaf are taking pragmatic approaches, looking to the economic as well as the ecological value of the forest. And some may not want the southern longleaf pine listed by the federal government as a threatened or endangered species. On the other hand, these folks would be among the first to tell you that some longleaf forests are getting a little help from creatures that are on the endangered list. This little fellow is the red cockaded woodpecker, an endangered species. He can survive in other kinds of pine forests, but in Alabama, the longleaf forest is a favorite habitat. This longleaf stand is protected because it's home to red cockaded woodpeckers. Here we find what's called a candle tree. You can see the sap running down and all around up there, making it look a lot like a candle with wax dripping down it. It was the red cockaded woodpecker making his home that released the sap. The sap keeps predators like snakes from being able to get to the woodpecker, and it traps small insects on which he can feast. The red cockaded woodpecker and its candle tree are just a couple of the fascinating things found in the longleaf forest. Other species, too, prefer the longleaf habitat. Among game animals, white-tailed deer, wild turkey, fox squirrel, and bobwhite quail, to name a few. Almost ironically, uh, one of the reasons we still have some uh, significant blocks of what at least resembles the native longleaf ecosystem is because of one of the inhabitants of that ecosystem, that's Bob White Quail. Uh, a number of uh, blocks of longleaf land were acquired by uh, wealthy industrials, typically around the 1920s, and most of them were from the Northeast, most of the buyers, who set them up as preserves where they could, in a very genteel fashion, Bob White Quail. And in the process, almost uh, as a side product, we maintained a, a longleaf ecosystem that uh, is invaluable today as a benchmark of what it can be and what it may have been at one time. Among the non-game species making a home under the longleaf, none is more important than the gopher tortoise. It's a burrowing species, so it digs um, really deep burrows that go perhaps uh, 10, 15, 20 feet into the ground. Um, and it really only comes out for courtship behavior, um, to bask a few times a day and to eat, and the rest of the time it spends in the burrow. 
The tortoise is described as a keystone species, and a keystone species is an organism that is so tightly interwoven with so many other organisms that if it were removed from the habitat, uh, the notion is the entire community would disappear. And because the tortoise builds these fantastic uh, burrow structures, they can be 10 feet deep, 30 feet long, uh, that creates a refuge for very many organisms, including uh, vertebrates, invertebrates. They also pile up a pile of sand at the mouth of the, the burrow, and that creates habitat for plants as well. It's been estimated that as many as 70 or so vertebrates and countless invertebrates take refuge from time to time in the gopher tortoise burrow. Seeking refuge from a scorching southern sun, bobcats, indigo snakes, rattlesnakes, skunks, and quail are among the critters known to frequent the burrow. Down in the uh, gopher tortoise burrow, the temperature remains a fairly constant 70 degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year, whether it be wintertime or summertime. So it's perfect conditions um, for the tortoise. One critter in particular really appreciates the hospitality of the gopher tortoise. This little fellow is the dusky gopher frog, and here in Alabama, he commands the concern of conservationists. Well, this is a frog that's in trouble. It is um, <clears throat> a species at risk. It's an interesting frog for a number of reasons. It lives in burrows underground. Most of them live in the um, burrows of the gopher tortoise. And uh, the number of breeding ponds is diminishing and uh, we're trying to increase the population. Uh, we're part of an effort uh, that involves a number of agencies. Alabama Natural Heritage Program, Auburn University, uh, the Forest Service, and of course we at the University of Montevallo um, a number of undergraduate students have assisted with this as well. You say 24? I've got number 25 here now, too. On a beautiful February day in the Conecuh National Forest, the team counts dusky gopher frog egg masses. The egg count gives them an idea how the frog is doing since the last time a count was made. I've collected eggs of both the gopher frogs, which are these larger eggs, and the leopard frogs here at this pond. These are much smaller. They're easy to tell apart uh, up close like this when they're side by side, but we're going to keep these as reference specimens so that when we're out there and we need to identify the gopher frog masses, we can have both on hand in little vials so that we can uh, tell which is which more easily. Some of the egg masses will be carried back to the University of Montebello. We usually come down at this time of the year and collect a, a mass of gopher frog eggs and take them back to the University of Montevallo. Uh, we hatch those and then we stock those into a recirculating water system and uh, put them into to boxes where we run feed tests and density trials and things like that. All right, there's 20. In the lab at Montevallo, the tadpoles are raised to a size where they will not be easy prey for hungry fish. Then they are returned to the pond from which they were gathered, or they are placed in new ponds to increase breeding populations in other areas. number 31 over here. The team counting and collecting dusky gopher frog eggs is wading through waters known to host alligators. They tell me they've seen alligators scurry away as they approach. Frankly, it's not the gators I could see that would worry me. The dedication of this team is exemplary of the enthusiasm inspired by so many of the special creatures and attributes of the longleaf ecosystem. And the teamwork we've seen here reflects another aspect of work with longleaf and its environs. This team is an alliance among different universities, 
the Alabama Natural Heritage Program, and the U.S. Forest Service. Likewise, the Longleaf Alliance is composed of a variety of public and private organizations. And then there's the Longleaf Ecosystem itself, which might be considered as nature's alliance. In many cases, the creatures that live under the Longleaf Canopy can exist elsewhere, but in alliance with the Longleaf and with each other, everyone's life is a little bit better. The tortoise, along with the longleaf pine, along with several other plants and animals and invertebrates, uh, all overlap each other, indicating some very long uh, linkage between those, those organisms. That creates that special habitat found nowhere else. Because the longleaf pine needles um, can cause fires from lightning strikes, it keeps the habitat open the way the tortoise likes it. As soon as you get encroachment of hardwood trees um, and a mid-story shrub layer, uh, the habitat closes in and the tortoises leave that area and will abandon burrows. The pragmatic approach to longleaf restoration and the alliances among the creatures that live in the longleaf habitat have led to some new ways of thinking about a variety of forest issues. Longleaf exists today by and large in a, a series of unconnected islands. What we're looking at now and has been done uh, a few places is to link up those areas. We think it may be possible to identify key gaps in that network and focus our efforts uh, on filling in those gaps with functioning longleaf ecosystems uh, through cost share programs or outright grants to private landowners. Uh, or other uh, landowners to encourage them to fill those gaps and link up those corridors. Restoring the remarkable longleaf ecosystem can't be done overnight. This new stand of longleaf, for example, are only about this high, and yet it's already 10 years old. It just takes the longleaf a longer period of time to get established than other pines. And we can't bring back the longleaf ecosystem without good management. At times, that includes the use of prescribed burns. The southern longleaf pine thrives with fire, and so do the plants and animals that live under its protective canopy. But how? Fire can be a violent force. How do the critters and the vegetation that live in the forest survive? In this part of the world, we have some of the highest lightning strike densities of anywhere in the, in the United States. And fire was a natural part of the system, so these longleaf pines evolved with fire. And uh, the needles burn readily, the cones burn, the litter burns. And if you burn on a regular basis, you didn't have a buildup of fuel. So you had a low intensity fires. And wildlife could move ahead of that. Uh, animals could move into the gopher bur burrows. There were escape areas birds could fly away. What you don't want is a huge fuel buildup and then to have catastrophic fires. The plant species that are out here all adapted to fire, this had burned maybe two months ago, and look at the growth on here. They all have organs under the ground that allow them to recover. So the system evolved with fire, and the species that um, lived here historically know how to get along with it. It's the things that come in from elsewhere that have trouble. So basically the fire does two things. It rejuvenates the system, and it drives out those uh, plants and animals that really don't belong here. Once again, the hospitality of the gopher tortoise comes into play. Not unusual when fire comes through to see the tortoises just wander right down their burrow where they uh, let the fire uh, burn over them and all those other organisms uh, do the same thing. Quail are known to go down the burrow. You know, they have been observed to do that as fire approaches. Uh, you'll find skunks in the bottom of the burrow, bobcats, indigo snakes, diamondback rattlesnakes. Uh, the mounds themselves probably altered the way that fire moved through the habitat. And again, uh, if you have tortoises in that landscape, it creates a patchier environment when you, when you burn, and that typically makes uh, for better habitat for many other organisms. It helps to maintain the diversity of things that were native to this area. A prescribed burn was used for this tract of forest land very recently, and already you can see the rebirth. Beneath the soil, there's much you can't see. 
Flowers like the exotic pitcher plant lie in wait for the warm sunlight the fire has allowed to find its way to the forest floor. Still, not every creature is necessarily thrilled with the prospect of fire in its habitat. Fire can be very destructive. Fire in the growing season, uh, which is uh, maybe the natural uh, period for lightning set fires, has the potential to destroy nests of ground nesting and shrub nesting birds. A good deal of research is being done right now to determine how significant that is. There is some evidence that it may not be as, as important as we think. Of course, to the bird whose nest is destroyed, it's very important. But on the population scale, it may not be. When is fire best used in managing our forest resources? What tracks of forest land are best linked together to provide extended corridors of forest habitat? How much more can we learn about the interrelationships of the animals in the forest ecosystem? These are important questions that will continue to need answers, and they must be answered by that other critter known to frequent the forest. Yeah. That other creature is man. And of course, woman. On a dark night deep in the Conecuh National Forest, a group of Alabama's elementary school teachers experience firsthand the richness of natural diversity in a longleaf ecosystem. The teachers are participants in Earth Lab, an environmental field school for elementary educators sponsored by the Southeast Alabama Regional In-Service Center. On this night, zoologist Mark Bailey leads the teachers into the Conecuh in quest of some of its noisiest inhabitants. The diversity of frogs in Alabama is really great. We have more frogs that are native to Alabama than uh, Florida, for example. And this part of the state is uh, the best place to find the most numbers of frogs. And not only is just hearing the sound, you're within one or two percent of Alabamians who've ever heard a pine barren tree frog, but that's even less actually seeing it. So mm -hmm. just keep your fingers crossed that you're seeing it because it's incredible, incredible. Of particular interest to the group tonight is the rare pine barrens tree frog. Mark Bailey imitates the Pine Baron's mating call, inciting the frog to respond and divulge its location. He's puffed himself up with air. Isn't that a pretty animal? Oh, yeah. Look at Look at that. the orange under his, under his legs there. Wow. So He's just full of air. Uh -huh. <laughs> excited. Kind of you off? Oh. Excited. Excited. Nothing well, if I was a snake, I might have a harder time swallowing him. <laughs> he was a hard one to get, wasn't he? Yeah, that's beautiful. This is the Pine Barrens tree frog. It wasn't found in Alabama until 1979. We know of about 20 places where it occurs in the state. His vocal pouch has been pooched out some. It's sort of stretched. Yeah. But we know it's a male because he was calling. Females don't, uh, don't call. He was really hard to find. Well, they just can't hold it after a while. They have to call. Yeah, like, like I said, this is one of the few places in the world now where you can find this, this frog. The longleaf pine forest is rich with nature. And as with other forest ecosystems across the state, the community of life in a healthy longleaf forest is an example of many complex natural relationships. The opportunity to experience Alabama's remaining longleaf forests is ours to enjoy. The opportunity to perpetuate this special part of Alabama's heritage is ours to embrace. Thank you.
This program is supported by grants from the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources State Lands Division, the Alabama Wildlife Federation, working for wildlife since 1935, and Legacy, partners in environmental education.